Hello there, everybody. My name is Christo Keller, and this is my final project presentation for Professor Rob Kustner's Math 563H Differential Geometry at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Spring 2020 semester moved online due to the coronavirus epidemic. I hope everybody's doing all right. I'm reporting in from a rather empty looking Cape Cod, but hopefully we can take our minds off things with a little bit of interesting geometry. My project is on totally geodesic submanifolds, which is why I decided to name it on totally geodesic submanifolds when I woke up in a flash of creative brilliance at 3.30 a.m. the other night. I said, ah, I ought to name it on totally geodesic submanifolds, because it's on totally geodesic submanifolds. But before we can talk about that, I'd like to get some background information out of the way, because I'm not sure what everyone's backgrounds are, and I'd like to keep this presentation as widely, widely uh, understandable as possible to the most number of people. So, the first thing we have to ask ourselves before we talk about sub-manifolds is what exactly a manifold is. The sorts of manifolds we're talking about are differentiable which means they're basically spaces like the Earth in the sense that at every point on the space, it looks like you're standing in a Euclidean space, a Rn with the Euclidean metric. So to formally define this, we say that a topological space M, uh, this is supposed to be the next slide, a topological space M is a differentiable manifold provided there are what are called charts that cover M. Now, a chart is an open subset U indexed by alpha in M together with a homeomorphism phi sub alpha mapping from U alpha to Rn. I hope that's legible enough for you. So you take these two things together and you get a chart on M. Now the chart defines a differentiable manifold if the union of the open subsets is M, notice that they're basically guaranteed to overlap, and, um, well, I already said these are homeomorphisms, and these being homeomorphisms formalizes the notion that the space looks like Euclidean space at every point. Now, this has to be, uh, uh, th this is an isomorphism in the category of topological spaces. The structure given to M by these charts basically allows you to do calculus on M. And so, at each point P which is just an element of M, you'll have a number of, um, of tangent vectors which form the tangent space of M at P, denoted T, P, M. These are basically the various derivatives at the point although 
the details are a little wonky. Now, if you take vectors in the tangent space, we want to give them an inner product to make the tangent space an inner product space. However, each tangent space could look very different from each other tangent space. So if you have a function that takes one of these points and it returns another function, uh, I suppose I should clear the screen here, make my marker a little smaller, a function that takes these points, which are n, m, and returns functions g sub m, which are themselves functions from the Cartesian product of TPM with itself to the real numbers, such that it is um, bilinear, symmetric, and non-degenerate, then you get a 0, 2 tensor, uh, a 0, 2 tensor field on, on M, which taken together with M, presuming M is a differentiable manifold, is called a Riemannian manifold if G is positive definite. Or the GM are it's basically the same thing, positive definite. So at this point it's natural to ask when does a differentiable manifold have a metric tensor that gives it the structure of a Riemannian manifold? That is, when does there exist such a metric tensor? And the answer is very nice. In fact, there is always such a metric tensor. And to prove this without getting too deep into the gory details, we'll need the notion of a partition of unity. A partition of unity is a set of continuous functions, pi, on a topological manifold x, in this case that will correspond to m, mapping points into the unit interval. Just just to the unit interval, I don't mean to suggest it's necessarily injective. Now, a partition of unity has the specific properties that the pi's sum to one at every point, and this isn't too relevant to us, but most of the pi's are, are not, uh, I'm sorry, are zero at each point. But we have a locally finite covering, probably, of um, our manifold, so that doesn't have to be important most of the time. Now, such a partition of unity is called subordinate to a cover if the support of each row i is contained in a u i. So in particular, the support are the um, the x that are not mapped, that's p in this case, sorry, pi doesn't map to, to 0. So these functions will be, um, will only be non-zero on a particular open cover, on a particular chart of um, a differentiable manifold. And of course, whenever there is an open covering, there is such a partition of unity. That's where I'm being hand wavy. So we can use it. And we'll use it to construct the metric tensor. So we have these u alphas 
the open uh, co covers of the open subsets of M, which cover it, along with homeomorphisms from each open subset into R M into open subsets specifically of R M. So what we want are functions from M to functions into R. Now, we have a familiar metric tensor, the Euclidean metric tensor, or a familiar um, metric, the Euclidean metric, that maps from Rn to R. So nicely enough, we can pull back phi, each phi alpha, along GE to get a function GE of phi alpha of M in U alpha. Bad notation, I'm sure, but I think you understand. That maps from U alpha to um, to functions into So in particular, that, that is the metric tensor. Now, this is only defined for each open subset alpha, but we can play with it. We can take the sum over the alpha of these pullbacks. And now we will run into the issue that some points will fall into two different open subsets. And then the sum will work out to the, the sum of two different metric-like things, say g1 plus g2, or however many there are, which might not make any sense, especially because, I mean, you don't even know what the domain is. It doesn't make any sense to add functions that have different domains. So we have this partition of unity subordinate to the, the U alpha, a bunch of rho alpha that we can dump in here, which will uniquely pick one of these um, open open subsets for each point because these supports have to be contained specifically for each row alpha in that U alpha. So given a point in the support, it'll only be in, in one of these subsets and the sum will always have the right It'll always have one, for each point, it'll have one U alpha as its domain. And then this is a metric tensor on M. I mean, it gets, it gets the linearity and the symmetry from, and even the positive definiteness. It, it basically just inherits everything from the Euclidean metric tensor. So that's a nice result that I thought was fun to share. And if you look it up, you can get the details, for instance, why the partition of unity exists, which I kind of glossed over.
Now, probably should have ended this slide here, but this is pretty quick. It's exactly what you expect. A Riemannian sub-manifold is a um, differentiable sub-manifold M, say M prime, contained in M taken together with the restriction of the metric tensor, let's say G prime, the restriction G prime of the metric tensor of M on M prime. And um, this will always give a, a submanifold trying to do this. And it's important to think about why, because I got tricked when I was trying to do this with semi-Riemannian manif manifolds originally, because I figured that the induced, the induced metric would always give a semi-Riemannian manifold. Did not. So a semi-Riemannian manifold is only, G is only necessarily non-degenerate. Rather than positive definite. But part of a non-degenerate field could be degenerate, because it's only part of the field. The whole field isn't non-degenerate, but the part is. So if you just take just that part, I don't think this is very um, illustrative, but you can imagine if you had a sphere and only the equator was zero in the vector field, then the equator would be a submanifold, a submanifold in the sense just this differentiable of the sphere. But the um, the induced metric would be zero everywhere, so it wouldn't even be non-degenerate, and hence it wouldn't be semi-Riemannian. However, the Riemannian manifolds require positive definiteness, so any sub sub-differentiable manifold of a sub of a Riemannian manifold will still be positive definite and the other properties are straightforward. So that's nice. Now we know what a submanifold is. We're getting closer to being able to talk about the title of the presentation. We know what submanifolds are. Now on I think we understand even we don't have a good formal account of it, but totally geodesic, these need to be explained. So let's talk about geodesics. I think we understand from our shared experience of math 563H what a curve is, uh, namely a map gamma from what we've been calling I, which is basically the real numbers, to the, the space itself, in this case our Riemannian manifold M. And let's assume for fun that it's twice differentiable. I like to just assume it's differentiable enough, or just smooth, whatever that means. Now, this gamma is called a geodesic if its derivative field is parallel. That is parallel. That is, um, it, the, the velocity doesn't change, so the acceleration is zero. These curves have very nice properties in Riemannian manifolds that are, um, well, we'll get to s at least one of them later, but they give um, the easy paths to follow on the manifold, so like the great circles of a sphere. If you're walking, I should make this bigger, between two points on a sphere, the quickest path is usually through a great circle rather than, you know, this. <laughs> right, or something even wonkier, I'm sure you can imagine. Now, the geodesics, I guess this is one property we have to talk about, of on a Riemannian manifold 
are completely determined at each point. Um, by the starting velocity. So the velocity of, at, at the beginning or at a point of a curve has to be a tangent vector to the curve. So in particular, it will be in the tangent space of M at P. And um, I can point you to O'Neill's book, which proves it's about semi-Riemannian manifolds, but Riemannian manifolds are a superset of those. Or sorry, there's a subset of those. I'm trying to be too fancy here. Um, it's, let me look at my paper, lemma 3.22. Uh, so if you, once you choose the starting velocity at a point of a curve, say V, for a creative vector V, then you get a, a single geodesic, namely a single curve. Now, there are geodesics in a, any manifold, which means there are also geodesics in a submanifold. And you might be tempted to think maybe the geodesics are the same, because, well, take the sphere again and the equator, which I'm going to call E with. Um, uh, superscripted Icelandic form, because I didn't know what to call it in the moment. Sorry, ev, superscripted Icelandic, lowercase ev. And um, that's supposed to say sn over here. And then the geodesics on sn are the, um, the great circles. And the equator is its own geodesic, which is also a great circle, so the geodesics of the subset here are the submanifold here are contained in the original manifold. But that was just luck because we're with a nice example, you can imagine. There are uh, say submanifolds like this on the circle, where in the original circle the geodesic from this point to that point went like this. But on the new manifold, which thinks it is straight, it itself is straight, the manifold, the, the geodesic goes around like that. I don't know if you can fix this bad color. There goes around the manifold. So the manifold thinks it looks like this. The submanifold. This is, I should have used better colors, but this is the submanifold. Um, we have these. It. We have these two points on the submanifold, one, two, and the geodesic on the submanifold itself looks like this, while the geodesic on the original manifold looks more like that, and those are clearly different. So now we have to wonder, when do, when exactly, do the... Um, geodesics of the sub-manifold match up with those of the original manifold. And so this is um, given by the shape tensor being exactly zero on M, the sub-manifold. Um, this intuitively means that the sub-manifold doesn't pull away from the original manifold. So there, I'm going to call it squiggly line relation. Waves, woo. The, uh, they're very closely packed up against each other. And you can go through the technical details of what the shape manifold is and so forth on my paper. But um, I skim over the, basically all of it. You, you have a, a, a uh, intuitive notion of directional derivative connecting to uh, vector fields on M. The, uh, I'll 
put bars over everything to represent that the the soup is super manifold. And so you you also get from this uh, induced directional derivative like thing on on uh, on the submanifold, which is not sometimes I'll say is only sometimes uh, partially perpendicular to M. So in particular, this induced connection on, on the submanifold is a direct sum of the tangent space at this point of M plus the, the normal. So that, nor that tangent component is, is really what we're talking about in terms of the derivative on M, and that gives the tangent space, while the normal is this thing called the second fundamental form, which was said in Euclid's theory. But I want to do a project more synthetically, so the details of that are a bit of a pain. You can see again in your favorite Riemannian geometry book. Um, so that's what we have for that. Now what we wanted to do, that, that thing we are talking about was the Lovely-Savita connection the induced connection where the, the, the d's basically was the, the levi Savita one was the d bar and the induced connection was the, the d. And so the levi Savita connection on the regular m was the tangent part to, to d. Now, and then the shape tensor was the normal part. So we want to create these, uh, what, what is totally geodesic. That, that's what we were talking about when we said the, the geodesics of the Submanifold are also geodesics of the original manifold. So, if gamma is a geodesic of of the submanifold, then gamma is a geodesic of the supermanifold. Of course, you'll be missing some of the d's, but that's what it means to be totally geodesic. So, we want to see how we can how we can construct totally geodesic subspace submanifolds of a Riemannian manifold because that would be a nice thing to do. It seems harder than you think. You can't just guess them all as very easily as well, who knows what you can do when you're talking about complicated spaces and the sphere is nice to work with, but there are much more complicated spaces. So we introduce the notion of isometry, which is a diffeomorphism, which I call an endodiffeomorphism from the manifold to itself that preserves the metric tensor so if you pull the metric tensor back along along this uh, this isometry, you get the metric tensor back. That is, g of phi of m in m. To use notation I made up like a couple of slides ago is itself g of of phi. Now. Isometries, in other words, preserve the distance on a manifold. So if you have like Euclidean one space, which is an example I'll like to use in a second, then, then multiplication by negative one, basically flipping or maybe rotating by pi over two the whole space. Uh, I'm sorry, math major here, rotating by pi the whole space gives um, an isometry because any two points, say this one and this one, well, they just move over here and they're the same distance apart and you check all the cases. Basically a symmetry in some sense, of a nice symmetry of the space. So any function, and in particular, Isometries have a fixed point set, which is the m that the isometry sends back to themselves. So in our example before of the rotation, well, all of these move r plus and all of r minus moves, but the origin doesn't move, so we'd say that the fix is equal to the origin in this case, or whatever doesn't move under the uh, whatever is fixed by the isometry. 
So um, if you have an isometry, then it's fixed point set. Not there yet. Um, this is Klingenberg's paper, uh, book, Theorem 1.10.15, 1 is either a point like that, each connected component is either a point or it's a, it's not a point. In fact, it could be really big. It doesn't have to be a straight line. Like if we had started with Euclidean three space, and and uh, flipped a, a, around one of the uh, around a plane, rather than around just the origin, then you know all the the three space on each side would would switch with each other. But this whole plane would remain constant, so the fixed place would be two. The fixed fixed points uh, space would be two dimensional. The connected component would be two dimensional, and so forth. You can get basically whatever you want if you choose the right isometry and the right space and everything. So it's very complicated thing. But it'll either be a point or it won't be a point. That's basic logic. If it's a point, then it's a totally geodesic submanifold. Trivially, I mean, there's really not much structure to it at all. But it, it makes, for instance, this theorem work. It lets you have zero-dimensional manifolds, and that's nice. But if it's not a connected component, then um, well, it, it it should still be a differentiable manifold because it's part of a big differentiable manifold, and so we can call it C. And take the submanifold induced by the metric tensor. Again, this is technically a different metric tensor because the induced one, but it's close enough that I'll just call it. I'll just call it G. So the the tangent vectors will also be fixed by the isometry. because the, the points themselves are fixed, so the tangent spaces are fixed. And, um, or there, there, there'll be some, some uh, um, fixed tangent vector. So you only get the ones lying on the, the manifold. So, so the, the sub-tangent space will, will remain fixed that, that lies along the the new manifold, even if the original tangent space were two-dimensional, in this case it'll be one-dimensional because you said the connected component was one-dimensional or whatever. So um, you you can take the, the geodesics on this this C will be completely determined by these vectors, but then each of these points will also have to have been fixed under the isometry because they were completely determined by this fixed vector. And so the, the geodesic couldn't have moved. No part of it could have changed. So that is this this um, connected component of the fixed set of the isometry is totally geodesic. Now um, this isn't enough to always let us construct a new a new um, submanifold, a totally geodesic submanifold because for instance, some manifolds might not have any isometries, any non-trivial isometries. The identity map will always be an isometry. However, if you um, the connected component of the fixed points that will be the set itself, and so the induced metric will be the metric itself, and the manifold will the sub in quotes manifold won't be proper. It will be the manifold itself, and so you haven't really done anything with these definitions. Say it's a submanifold. It's not an interesting one. So, uh, for instance, if you take the earth and you and you smooth it out, then um, you probably won't have any isometries because what what could you do to the earth to change it? Well, keeping me the same, or keeping um, Bob Kusner's office the same, or whatever. And you would you just end up with a trivial isometry only, and then. There's nothing interesting there. And uh, the, probably not the case that every totally geodesic submanifold is a fixed point set of some isometry. And the example in my paper here is that the, the positive real numbers submanifold of the Euclidean one space, but 
a, there's no isometry on the Euclidean one space that only preserves the real numbers, but this is kind of just um, playing with definitions again because the, the, the real, the positive real numbers are isomorphic to the, uh, the Euclidean one space double. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm realizing that the, uh, if, if I include the uh, zero, then it becomes clopen. And then uh, the clopen, that is r greater than or equal to zero, won't be the fixed point set of any isometry, but it should still be a totally geodesic submanifold. But uh, that actually can't be right because it's not a differentiable manifold. In particular, there's no there's no open covering. So that's what I get for trying to think about things on the spot instead of um, just reading off my paper. But I guess that's a difficulty of presentation. Get an appreciation for it when you actually try to teach something like this, especially with no audience to talk about, or something that Professor Cosmo mentioned in one of his uh, uh, Zoom parties. So uh, there's some interesting papers we can you can look at if you're very advanced ability to read differential geometry papers and interested in this thing. It's a paper Tsukata 1999, which gives examples of of manifolds with no totally geodesic submanifolds, no non-trivial ones at least, not proper submanifolds. And these examples were generalized by Murphy Wilhelm 2018, which claims as its title, random manifolds have no totally geodesic submanifolds. So in general, manifolds won't have totally geodesic submanifolds. I don't think that's surprising really, but um, that's just intuition. Intuition just knows work. I guess that's basically the end of my presentation. If you watch through it, I appreciate it. Um, you can send me feedback at cmkeller at umass.edu. I enjoyed looking into this topic. I suppose I should show the work cited. Thank Professor Kustner for pointing out the problem, which I really find is a fascinating subject if it's a little difficult to, to get into. Um, and I hope I've given you some appreciation for it, for at least Riemannian geometry, hopefully this, this notion of, of total geodesy, and um, the specific construction he found for submanifolds given an isometry on the manifolds. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope I wasn't totally incoherent and mostly correct. It's been a pleasure to be part of this very unusual class this semester. And I, um, again, I hope everyone stays healthy and we get things back normal as soon as we can. Uh, thanks for watching and have a great day.